Imagine waking up tomorrow and finding your whole identity had been deleted. That everything that you knew, a country that you'd lived in for many years, had suddenly become entirely foreign. Well, this is the story of exactly that. 2021 marks the 30th anniversary of Slovenia's declaration of independence from Yugoslavia. But while it largely missed the violence that engulfed much of the rest of the Federation, it nevertheless became the centre of a serious human rights violation when it deliberately erased tens of thousands of Yugoslavs living in the country. Hello and welcome. If you're new to the channel, my name is James kerr -Lindsay, and here I take an informed look at international relations, conflicts and the origins of countries. One of the key questions in any independence process is what happens to citizens from one part of a political union living in a part that's breaking away. In the worst and most extreme cases, they can suddenly become targets of violence and extremism, even resulting in genocide or ethnic cleansing. However, even in relatively peaceful processes, serious issues can arise. People who had been full members of a society with clear rights can suddenly come to be seen as unwanted foreigners with little, if any, protection. One particularly good example arose with the breakup of Yugoslavia at the start of the 1990s. While many people are aware of the brutal conflicts and horrific wars that took place as the Federation collapsed, there's another chapter that's rather less known. Slovenia's attempt to remove the identity of large numbers of Yugoslavs living on its territory. Slovenia lies in Southeast Europe. At 20,000 square kilometres or 7,800 square miles, it's the 150th largest of the 193 members of the United Nations. The population is currently around 2.1 million, putting it in the 149th place. According to the last available census carried out in 2002, 83% were ethnic Slovenians. The largest minorities were ethnic Serbs, who made up around 2%, Croats, who made up around 1.8%, and Muslims, mainly Bosniaks, who made up 1.6%. 2.2% were classed as others and 9% were classed as unknown. Within these figures included Hungarians, Italians, Albanians and Roma. Slovenia has a long history. However, for our purposes, the story really starts in the early 20th century. Prior to 1918, the territory had been part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. However, as the empire collapsed at the end of the First World War, it became part of a new political union of South Slavs, the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, which was renamed the Kingdom of Yugoslavia in 1929. Following the end of the Second World War, the kingdom came under communist rule, eventually becoming the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, a political union made up of six separate republics. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and Slovenia. As the most economically advanced part of the Federation, Slovenia became a popular destination for economic migrants from the rest of Yugoslavia, especially Croatia and Bosnia. Indeed, around 200,000 are believed to have eventually settled in the country. In 1980, Josip Broz Tito, the leader of Yugoslavia since the end of the Second World War, died this set in train a process of state collapse. While the causes of Yugoslavia's breakup are complex and still fiercely contested, by the end of the decade the country was clearly coming under threat as the Republic sought to go in different directions. In December 1990, Slovenia held an independence referendum that saw 96% of those taking part opt to break away. Six months later, on the 25th of June 1991, Slovenia declared independence. In an attempt to keep the Federation together, the federal government ordered troops of the Yugoslav National Army to put down the attempted secession. However, within days and facing a greater challenge in neighbouring Croatia, which had also declared independence on the same day as Slovenia, the government agreed a ceasefire. Under an internationally brokered deal, Slovenia officially agreed to continue negotiations on the future of Yugoslavia. However, in reality, the country was allowed to go its own way. Having broken away from Yugoslavia, Slovenia now began the process of state building. As part of this, it passed legislation calling on all Yugoslav citizens living in the country to apply for citizenship by the 26th of December 1991. While 170,000 people applied, a large majority of the Yugoslavs living in Slovenia 
tens of thousands failed to meet the deadline. In most cases, this was because they failed to realise the significance of what was happening. However, some had their applications rejected because they'd been part of the Yugoslav army and had taken part in the effort to prevent Slovenia's secession. Whatever the reasons for the failure to meet the deadline, a little under two months later, in February 1992, the Slovenian government ordered that all those who hadn't applied for citizenship should be deleted from the list of permanent residents and instead registered as foreigners. Moreover, any Slovenian documents they held, such as an identity card or driver's license, were to be annulled. There were numerous reports of people going to government offices to apply for residency or to renew their paperwork only to see their documents shredded in front of them. In total, 25,671 people, around 1% of the country's population, were affected. The results on those involved, now widely known as the erased, were catastrophic. Many suddenly found themselves deprived of any sort of access to state services. They lost their pensions, state housing, access to healthcare, and other social rights. Many also lost their jobs and without proof of a right to work found it impossible to gain new employment. In some cases this saw families reduced to poverty with no access to unemployment benefits or other state aid. Children were even denied education. In the most severe cases those born in Slovenia but not registered elsewhere in the Federation effectively became stateless persons. In the period that followed, many of those affected had little choice but to leave the country, either to go back to other parts of war-torn Yugoslavia or else emigrate elsewhere in Europe. Others were simply deported. Those who found a way to stay now tried to resolve the situation, but with little success. The Slovenian government showed no interest in dealing with a problem affecting a small and largely marginalised part of society. In 1999, the issue finally came before the Slovenian Constitutional Court. In the landmark ruling, it recognised that the decision to delete the records had indeed been unlawful and ordered the government to address the issue. In response, the government introduced new legislation giving those affected a further three-month window to apply for Slovenian citizenship. Crucially, however, it didn't address the underlying problems the Erased had faced over the previous decade, nor did it allow those who'd been expelled to return. As a result, four years later, the Constitutional Court issued another ruling that the rights of those affected should be applied to the point where their records were deleted. Although this led to yet another window for people to apply to regularise their status, the government still refused to put in place retrospective measures to help those affected. Quite apart from the 6,000 or so still facing problems registering, even those who had secured their status by now faced residual problems, such as gaining access to full state pensions. On top of this, there was still no compensation for the suffering and hardship they'd endured, nor was there any help to meet the legal costs associated with fighting their cases. By now, the issue had been going on for well over a decade, and yet the Slovenian government still refused to move on the main points. If anything, it was becoming even more difficult to resolve as the issue became increasingly politicised. In a country trying to disassociate itself from its Yugoslav past, many ordinary Slovenes had little if any sympathy for a group largely seen as foreign economic migrants who should have done what they were told when they were told. Others painted those affected as enemies of the state who tried to deny the existence of an independent Slovenia. This was underscored in a referendum held in April 2004 asking whether the arrays should have their rights returned. 94% of those taking part voted no. On the 1st of May 2004, Slovenia became the first of the former Yugoslav republics to join the European Union. By now, the Slovenian government was coming under increasing pressure from various human rights organisations as well as leading international bodies, including the United Nations and the Council of Europe. But while there appeared to be some growing awareness of the need to deal with the issue, very little was done in the years that followed. In 2006, 11 of the arrays brought the matter before the European Court of Human Rights, the highest legal body dealing with human rights issues in Europe. Four years later, it ruled in their favour. 
However, this was challenged by the Slovenian government. As a result, in 2012, the Grand Chamber of the Court confirmed that Slovenia had in fact violated Articles 8, 13 and 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights, clauses guaranteeing respect for the private and family life of individuals, the right to an effective remedy and the prohibition of discrimination. Slovenia was now given one year to set up an appropriate compensation scheme. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it failed to do so. As a result, in 2014, the court ordered the government to pay almost a quarter of a million euros in compensation to the applicants. Facing a massive wave of cases, the Slovenian government finally decided to comply with the rulings. As well as committing to end the violations of human rights and prevent all future such violations, it established a compensation scheme for those affected. By February 2016, this had paid out 22 million euros to around 5,300 people. On the 25th of May that year, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, which had ultimate responsibility for supervising the execution of the court's final judgment, declared that Slovenia's measures were satisfactory. As far as it and Slovenia were concerned, the matter of the erased was now closed. In truth, though, it continued. Despite the rulings, many affected are still being denied justice, finding themselves ineligible for the scheme or unable to pay for the legal fees required to put in a claim. Even now, three decades after the events, many of the erased are still fighting for justice. The question of what happens to people following the breakup of states is one of the most important issues in any process of secession or state dissolution. The example of Slovenia provides a fascinating insight into how complex the issue can be. While the country didn't witness the brutal genocides and ethnic cleansings that we saw elsewhere in Yugoslavia, indeed, it should be stressed that the vast majority of Yugoslavs living in the country were in fact granted full citizenship. A small number nevertheless faced extremely serious human rights violations that successive governments refused to tackle despite numerous national and then international court rulings. It was only when faced with significant financial penalties that the Slovenian government finally decided to act. As we mark the 30th anniversary of the collapse of Yugoslavia, the story of the erased in Slovenia sheds light on a rather different and little known human rights issue that emerged from the chaos and conflict at the time. I hope you found that interesting. If so, here are some more videos that you might find useful. And please do consider supporting the channel either by subscribing or joining. I've put a link below. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next video.